Hi everyone, my name is Dechen and I'm the development coordinator at Students for Free Tibet. As you may know, uh, my father is Tibetan and my mother is Kalmyk. Kalmyks are originally from the Oivat region of Western, uh, the Oivat group of Western Mongolia. And since the 17th century have established a republic in Russia called Kalmykia. <clears throat> Today, I will be interviewing a dear friend of mine, Ingba, the director of the Southern Mongolian Human Rights Information Center to tell us more about the language rights protest in Southern Mongolia, and we'll share what you can do to support during the Global Day of Action, which is coming up on October 1st. Tens of thousands of Mongolians in Southern Mongolia have protested everywhere, from the streets to the classroom, responding to a new curriculum that would mandate core subjects to be taught in Chinese rather than in the Mongolian language. Mongolians have engaged in creative, bold, and inspiring acts of resistance, such as signing petitions, writing banners of protest in Mongolian calligraphy, and boycotting classrooms. This act of linguistic erasure is part of a larger systemic effort to take away mother tongue education for Mongolians, Uyghurs, and Tibetans and replace it with Chinese medium teaching. Here at Students for a Free Tibet, we have seen similar attacks by the Chinese government on Tibetan language inside of Tibet. And Tibetans have also risen up in defense of their language many times over in recent years. We stand in solidarity with <clears throat> Southern Mongolians as they defend their right to learn and to be taught in their own language. During the past few weeks, four to 5,000 people have been put into police custody, while at least nine have lost their lives. We will be joined by Ingfat, who was born in Southern Mongolia in 1972, he came to the United States in 1998, and in 2001, he established the Southern Mongolian Human Rights Information Center, a New York-based human rights organization dedicated to promoting and protecting human rights of the Mongolian people in the Chinese-occupied Southern Mongolia. He is the editor-in-chief of the organizational newsletter, Southern Mongolia Watch, that is published in English, Japanese, Chinese, and Mongolian. Since 1998, after his arrival in the U.S., he has testified on human rights conditions in Southern Mongolia before the U.S. Department of State, European Parliament, among many others. He has been interviewed by major news publications, including Time Magazine, CNN, New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, and we're very pleased to have him here today on SFT Live. Zenbeno, how are you? Zenbeno, <laughs> And I think we can get started now with some of these questions. Um, I think the biggest misconception about the protests in Southern Mongolia are, are that they're um, a new occurrence. Can you talk to us about Chinese colonial rule in Southern Mongolia, about its foundations? Can you give us a, a brief history lesson? Sure, thank you for having me. Um... Yes, uh, there have been an extensive coverage by the um, the major news media around the world uh, uh, on the the massive protests that are taking place in in southern Mongolia in the past um, uh, three to four weeks. Um, so one of the common things about the the uh, news coverage on the protests is that. Uh, the majority of them characterize these uh, Southern Mongolian protests as a uh, new or rare or surprise mm -hmm. uh, type of using this kind of words. So, um, in fact, Southern Mongolian resistance is uh, as old as uh, it's uh, 71 years, uh, or, uh, with, with the, the you know same with the uh, colonial occupation of the Chinese communist uh, regime. So, uh, in other words, Southern Mongolia started their resistance from the day one of the Chinese occupation of Southern Mongolia. So, Southern Mongolia was uh, an independent sovereign nation up until the 1949, when the Chinese uh, uh, communist regime officially annexed the vast territory to the so-called uh, you know, the People's Republic of China. And so, um, um, after the, uh, the annexation of Southern Mongolia to uh, China, 
uh, Southern Mongolians have never stopped their, their resistance. And uh, for that reason, China actually considers Southern Mongolia was the first and the most difficult nation to be tamed. Um, so uh, the Chinese government uh, formulated and tested um, all, almost all of their, their ethnic policies in, in Southern Mongolia first, because they consider Southern Mongolia was the, the, the most, the biggest threat to the, their regime. So <clears throat> uh, they, uh, for example, um, the very, um, the first, uh, the so-called ethnic, uh, well, I, at the beginning it's called nationality autonomy, autonomous region. Later, it was uh, depoliticized to ethnic minority regional autom autonomy. Uh, that was actually formulated and tested and implemented in Southern Mongolia first. And after some time, the, the communist regime realized that uh, it's pretty efficient uh, way of um, uh, controlling and um, controlling these uh, uh, the so-called minority people, so they started implementing the same policy um, in uh, in uh, Tibet and East Turkestan and also uh, to other regions, Ningxia and uh, the Guangxi, Zhuang um, uh, Zhuang nationality uh, autonomous region. So. Um, uh, in this sense, Southern Mongolia has always been China's uh, a testing ground uh, of, of their, their uh, national, uh, well, ethnic uh, policies, and including um, the uh, policies of genocide, ethnic cleansing, political repression, uh, cultural eradication, and environmental destruction. All these uh, really started from Southern Mongolia, and uh, f uh, for example, <clears throat> during the 1960s and 1970s, uh, Chinese government carried out a large-scale genocide in Southern Mongolia. Um, uh, at least 100,000 uh, Southern Mongolians were killed and uh, uh, half million persecuted. At that time, the total population of Southern Mongolia was about uh, only 1.5 million. So that means one third of the population was impacted by by this uh, the large scale genocide campaign. Later on, of course, they they used the same model, same way of handling the uh, uh, the so-called uh, ethnic minorities in in Tibet and uh, East Turkestan also now. Uh, yeah, everybody, you know, uh, as we know, the the government of China is implementing very similar um, genocide in in East Turkestan, and uh, um, at least uh, uh, a couple of several a million uh, Uyghurs were um, placed under internment camp in in, uh, in uh, East Turkestan. It was. Uh, the very similar moment, uh, um, uh, similar um, uh, genocide that took place in, in Southern Mongolia. So uh, regarding the resistant history, I mean, uh, Southern Mongolians uh, so never stopped um, their, their resistance despite the, the Chinese authorities' heavy-handed policy. Uh, for example, if you look back the history, just, just uh, um, uh, only nine years ago, there was another large-scale protest, <coughs> protest in, in Southern Mongolia. Uh, the protest was sparked by the, the brutal killing of a Mongolian herder uh, by a Chinese uh, uh, truck driver uh, in, in Southern Mongolia. And then uh, the thousands of students and the herders took to the street and uh, the uh, protest uh, quickly spread across the region, and uh, uh, well, the same news media, uh, the major news uh, media covered uh, uh, this uh, protest, and uh, I was uh, I was surprised that they call <laughs> this movement as a rare and new. Mm -hmm. It was only nine years ago. I mean, uh, they should uh, really read their the uh, the past news coverage. Uh, uh, before you know, characterizing this this uh, uh, round of a protest as rare.
Mm-hmm. Can you share with us uh, what does Chinese colonial rule look like in the present day? I know you touched on that a bit in, in the last question. Well, um, uh, yes, the Chinese colonial uh, regime it is to the, to the southern Mongolians, the, this regime is colonial occupation. It's a colonial regime. It's not the, not just the uh, you know communist regime. It's it's uh, the most importantly, it's a colonial regime. And uh, uh, as I mentioned earlier, uh, it's it's uh, very brutal and uh, oppressive and in, inhuman um, in, in nature. For uh, for example. The, there has been uh, waves of ethnic cleansing and political purge, uh, uh, like uh, in the 1960s and 70s. So there was a large scale uh, genocide that I mentioned earlier. And then uh, the, after the, the physical genocide was um, uh, concluded, then the Chinese government actually implemented uh, another wave of genocide, which we call as a cultural genocide. Uh, for example, in 2001, the Chinese government uh, came up with a, a new uh, policy called uh, ecological migration. Um, uh, under this policy, um, the entire uh, Mongolian herders populations were targeted. And the Chinese government's just, justification for this policy was that um, Southern Mongolian grassland uh, uh, has uh, seriously degraded because of the Mongolian back- backward way of life. So that's their justification. Mm-hmm. And even though actually the, the root cause of the, the environmental degradation is not Mongolian traditional way of life, but the Chinese, uh, uh, the unregulated practice of large-scale farming and mining, but the government of China never mentioned uh, about uh, anything about their their uh, destruction of, of uh, the Mongolian grassland. So they implemented that policy, and then they were they targeted the entire Mongolian herders population. They um, uh, <clears throat> started uh, forcibly. Uh, Moving these people from the, the Mongolian herders from their ancestral lands to mm-hmm. uh, overwhelmingly Chinese populated uh, agricultural and urban areas. So that was that was uh, the the policy called ecological migration. Later on, Chinese government also adopted another set of policy called livestock livestock grazing ban. So Mongolian people were nomadic people, right? So they have been practicing, uh, they have practiced their traditional nomadic way of life for thousands of years on the Mongolian plateau to maintain the uh, the very delicate balance between uh, human and nature. Uh, but now the, the Chinese government said, okay, so, uh, you must stop practicing your traditional nomadic way of life. And they, um, uh, so, uh, they actually, according to the Chinese uh, uh, State Council website, um, by end of 2015, China uh, would have already settled uh, China uh, uh, the settled all the the uh, nomadic uh, pastoralist people within its territory. That means not only the Mongolians but also Tibetan herders and even Kazakhs were forcibly um, settled, removed from, uh, displaced from their, their lands to somewhere else. Well, they, they uh, normally they build some some villages called new immigrants village, and um, and then they just put those people into to those places. So that's that's uh, yeah, how how this. Uh, the cultural genocide uh, started, and then so after that, uh, the all the nomadic way of Mongolian traditional way of life was pretty much wiped out, and so now the government is starting to <clears throat> take away the Mongolian language, which Mongolians consider as, as their the last uh, uh, stronghold of their national identity. So uh, the Mongolians uh, consider. 
uh, if if they lose uh, their language, they lose everything. They uh, will cease to exist as as a distinct people. So, and that is why uh, the entire nation is rising up to resist this uh, the, the so-called uh, new uh, second uh, second uh, uh, generation bilingual education, which is which is just uh, the extension of the uh, the seven decade of cultural genocide. Can you tell us about the three year plan to replace Mongolian with Mandarin as the language of instruction? Yes, there have been um, uh, some official documents issued by the Chinese authorities mentioning that uh, um, uh, the policy, the so-called uh, the new uh, bilingual education or second generation bilingual education uh, policy uh, is is a three year plan that uh, you know in which they just mentioned uh, only a few subjects uh, will gradually be taught in Chinese. Not not uh, you know once uh, everything is once. Uh, chin chin, uh, you know, uh, together. But they they were saying this is just a gradual plan, three year plan, and uh, they mentioned only uh, I think three or four subjects. But the in reality, uh, actually everything everything have already changed. So they they claim that three year plan. Uh, they even said that the five no change. Meaning mm -hmm. the five things will not change. So what they were saying, the these five th things include um, the curriculum will not change, and then course schedule will not change, and language of instruction will not change, and then Mongolian literature will not change, and the current bilingual uh, educational system will not change. So look at this, right? Let's let's go through one by one. So um, curriculum will not change; it's already changed. It's it's yep. outright lie. And then saying course schedule will not change, which already is changed. We we got a lot of evidence from the uh, the Mongolian uh, parents showing that the the almost all the uh, the five have already changed. And the language of instruction will not change. Look, you are changing it, then you're claiming it not changing. <laughs> and, uh, and the Mongolian literature will not change. Of course, it's Mongolian literature will be taught as a, um, well, pr pretty much just Mongolian language will be taught as a foreign language. So it, it's a big change. And then current bilingual uh, educational system will not change. You are changing it, then you are saying not changing it. So. Mm -hmm. How this is, you know, self-conflicting statement it, it is. Uh, so, um, so the, uh, uh, the unfortunately, uh, uh, many news media around the world are quoting from um, the these documents, uh, saying that hey, uh, looks like it's only minor changes uh, going on. And then why the Southern Mongolians are like. Uh, uh, were reacting uh, mm -hmm. to to have this kind of uh, protest, so we know what what the Chinese government is really uh, intended to do. Uh, the Mongolians have a long experience uh, uh, dealing with the Chinese, you know, propaganda and Chinese uh, rhetoric. So we know that they, they they are their goal is to wipe out the Mongolian language, wipe out the Mongolian culture, and more, wipe out the Mongolian uh, identity. So that's that's their true, real true goal. They are just you know intentionally putting out that kind of document to mislead the international community, uh, which is uh, in in some sense is pretty successful because um, I see I see many news reports are saying hey uh, yeah just just uh, three they're mentioning three courses are changing no it is not it's not three it. it Already, it had already changed. You know, the government of China already changed the all of them. We 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 received some uh, video clips. We re received some you know uh, audio uh, testimony from from the parents uh, saying that all of these have already changed. Mm -hmm. 
Can you talk to us about the language rights protests? How many people are involved? I know that many students, teachers, and parents are protesting. Can you tell us more about that? Uh, sure. Um, the, the estimated number of students uh, took part of this, this um, uh, protest and, and school boycott uh, mm -hmm. is around 300,000. This include wow. uh, many, uh, uh, the most of Mongolian uh, elementary school, middle schools, uh, high school, and even even uh, some uh, college uh, students. So um, that's that's in terms of the number of uh, students took took part um, uh, who took part in the in the moment. So other than that, actually this protest. It's, it's a really, uh, it's a typical non-violent, non-cooperation, uh, civil disobedience, ma mass resistance movement. It's, it's not just uh, by students, but uh, also, uh, in, uh, in fact, that the entire Mongolian, Southern Mongolian population uh, joined the, these uh, protests. Uh, uh, so, the people from all walks of life of Southern Mongolia, including like uh, uh, elementary school students, from uh, uh, to to top uh, intellectuals, college professors, from middle schoolers to college students and ordinary herders, to uh, rural villagers, even from you know taxi drivers to delivery men, and then some uh, girls, uh, government official and. Uh, party members, even some Mongolian police also joined mm. this protest. So this is a really as an, a nationwide uh, mass movement. Um, it's, it's sweeping across the entire uh, region. It's from the east to west, the entire uh, region uh, it, it was, uh, you know, t taking part of this, this uh, massive uh, resistance movement. Mm -hmm. Police are also offering a bounty for knowledge of the protesters. What are some of the common threats and forms of intimidation that are being used? Um, yes, uh, like in any other protest, uh, any other uh, protest in Southern Mongolia, in Tibet, in East Turkestan, and elsewhere, and in, uh, in China. So arrest, detention, imprisonment. Is the mo most uh, the first step of the crackdown, right? So, uh, um, like we estimate, uh, about four to five thousand people were put under some form of police custody, including uh, arrest, um, detention. Detention. They normally have two types of detention: administrative detention and criminal detention. And imprisonment, uh, they threaten the the activist with uh, imprisonment. Uh, we received some some information uh, about uh, certain uh, activists or even active long before this protest were were taken away, and uh, um, probably they will be, they will be um, tried and uh, sentenced in long term. Uh, imprisonment. So, uh, in addition to that, the, some other uh, the common methods of the intimidation or threat is that firing from jobs, uh, uh, remo rem removing people from their positions, expelling uh, students from schools, blacklisting the students, and uh, confiscating. Pro confiscating properties, including land. Uh, so uh, there have been hundreds of uh, Mongolian officials and teachers, even some school principal and some party members, some government officials, even some um, the TV hosts and uh, members of the, the uh, Official uh, news media uh, organization uh, like uh, Inner Mongolia TV and radio station uh, members, th more than 300 members uh, uh, jointly signed a petition 
uh, to protest against this new policy. Uh, so other than that, uh, so in order to force the parents to send their children back to the school, um, the Chinese authorities uh, um, uh, to threaten the, the rural herders and uh, rural uh, farmers who do not have any you know, official title or official jobs to lose, but they, they threaten them to confiscate their land if they don't mm -hmm. send their children back to school. So these are the most common uh, way of intimidation in, in, uh, the, during this protest. Mm -hmm. um, what tips can you share with us in using the correct terminology um, in being respectful of the protesters in Southern Mongolia? Like for example, saying Southern Mongolia and not Inner Mongolia not saying ethnic minorities uh, because China claims that Tibetans, Uyghurs, and Mongolians are ethnic minority subgroups of China among the 55 minorities after the PRC was formed. Um, yes, there, there, uh, there are many terminologies uh, that, that we really uh, uh, want the international community, people around the wo world to know. Uh, for example, uh, the the name of uh, the, the people or nation, Southern Mongolia, uh, which in in our language is uh, is a very simple. We call ourselves Ovur Mongol, and uh, we call uh, the independent uh, country of Mongolia as Ar Mongol. Uh, in in our language, it's a very simple geographical terminology meaning Ovur Mongol means Southern Mongolia. The Ar Mongol means northern Mongolia. Uh, of course, this is you know southern Mongolia is south of the Gobi Desert, desert and you know uh, northern Mongolia is north of the Gobi Desert. It, this is our traditional way of calling ourselves. Like, so uh, there's no reason for us to call ourselves inner or outer. We were just one nation, and we just. Uh, uh, the, uh, you know, it, it's southern uh, and northern was just a geographical terminology, but Chinese um, have intentionally used uh, this, uh, you know, translated this terminology into inner ne and why. Uh, they still call us, uh, you know, the southern Mongolia as ne mongol and uh, northern Mongolia as why mongol. Well, Look, independent country of Mongolia is it's already it has its own official name, which is uh, the previously called uh, People's Republic of Mongolia. Now it's called Mongolia. But Chinese, uh, a lot of Chinese still call the independent country of Mongolia as Outer Mongolia. So these are terminology that that we really um, we, uh, we have been. Um, uh, advocating and to use the the correct name for for years. Uh, for example, if you look at our organization name, we don't mm -hmm. call ourselves an Inner Mongolian uh, Human Rights Information Center. We call it Southern Mongolia Human Rights Information Center. And uh, so there there is the no reason for uh, Southern Mongolians to call themselves Inner or Outer. And and that, uh, but uh, unfortunately, still a lot of uh, news media and then uh, official uh, uh, government official terminologies, uh, not only here in the United States but also in Europe and around the world, they still you uh, like to use uh, Inner Mongolia. Uh, mm -hmm. So. That's that's something that we really uh, want the people to know the difference between inner and uh, uh, southern. It's inner is is a really you know Sinocentric uh, Chinese propaganda. So when you mm -hmm. talk when you say inner, you are just like standing in Beijing. You, you don't know you um, uh, you know just unknowingly you are standing in the position of China. Uh, you're you're mm -hmm. promoting China as the center of the earth, so mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, mm -hmm. so even uh, some scholars, so some yeah. some scholars who or even some Mongolian uh, scholar, I mean Mongolian scholars and uh, you know scholars who are doing research on Mongolian issue call Southern Mongolia 
as in Mongolia. So this mm -hmm. is, uh, the, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a really big gift for the Chinese regime. They're justifying their, their, like, yeah, this is inner Southern Mongolia, is internal or inner part of China. And this is their, their territorial claim, actually. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's one uh, one thing that that uh, uh, we really can just you know educate people about. Um, and and another thing, another t terminology, the, as as you mentioned, it's ethnic group, ethnic minorities. Uh, look, Tibet, Southern Mongolia, East Turkestan were never part of China up until just recently, right? Uh, 70 years ago. Uh, so we were sovereign nations, we were separate nations. So all of a sudden we turned into ethnic group and then they divided, they made up so many different ethnic groups. In, in, in history there were not that many uh, different nations. So now they, they, for example, within the so-called 55 ethnic minorities, at least five or six are Mongolian, the, the member of Mongolian nation in history. They just divide them into separate things. I think same is true for uh, Tibetans also. They, they uh, partition Tibet nation into many different, uh, several different, uh, the so-called ethnic minorities. So the, the very term ethnic minority in, in Chinese is called Xiao Shu Min Zhu. Well, in Chinese it didn't, change from the very beginning but in English it, 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 it has changed at the very beginning in the 1950s and 60s uh, even 1970s I think um, it, in English it was called nationality minorities and, and then later on in the 1980s the Chinese government intentionally translated the, uh, it into the same terminology into English as ethnic minorities. This is a this is actually a process of depoliticizing this this uh, terminologies. So the if you call these people as nationalities, the uh, the origin of the, the nationality is nation. So nation means these people have territory. They they uh, they were they were once sovereign and then mm -hmm. they had their own political structure, own government. So they are just uh, intentionally, they, they change it that into ethnic minority, which just implies pretty much it's just like cultural entity instead of, uh, you know, political, they are just depoliticizing, you know, taking away the political meaning of this, this terminology. So this is actually the, the very reason why the recently Chinese government um, has been implementing this new bilingual education. The, the, the driving theory of this uh, new bilingual education policy is the so-called second generation ethnic theory or ethnic policy. So, Chinese government then uh, recently uh, came up with an idea that, hey, everybody, uh, every the, the nationality, uh, ethnic groups, including 55 minorities and then Chinese, are the part member of the greater, the greater overarching uh, nationality, which is Zhonghua nationality. So there is the, the Chinese government's claim is that. Okay, there is no need for these uh, 55 minorities to have their distinct separate uh, ethnic identity. So they wanted to follow, they, they even uh, pub uh, publicly say that, claim that China is following the United States model of melting pot uh, mm -hmm. model. So everyone should just identify themselves as Zhonghua nationality. Zhonghua is nothing but Chinese, but the Zhonghua, the, so the, everyone should be Chinese. We should not uh, identify ourselves as Mongolians, Tibetans, Uyghurs. We should just, uh, the, that's, that's their theory. We, we will just, we just need to identify ourselves as a Zhonghua nationality, which means Chinese. 
That's the very reason, the driving, driving force of this new policy. Uh, so, uh, in uh, actually ten around about ten years ago, they when they came up with the the, the first uh, you know the, this theory, they wanted to test it in Southern Mongolia. They sent some scholars to Southern Mongolia, and then they met with a very strong uh, opposition and resistance from the Mongolian scholars and you know professors and even ordinary students. So they uh, they did not implemented immediately but now are they are they already implementing it so the the so called uh, the common language is serving the purpose of putting making everyone a Zhonghua nationality not not uh, you know uh, allowing them to have their separate uh, national identity mm -hmm. um i just have a quick question from one of our viewers um, someone wants to know if Southern Mongolia has a national anthem. Well, very good question. Um, the, we uh, have, uh, it's pretty much agreed upon uh, a national anthem, not a formal one, but uh, we do have a, a, a song that almost uh, everyone thinks is with our national anthem, which is uh, uh, this is a, a, a song about the national hero uh, who uh, fought the Chinese uh, to death. And then, so uh, this song is, is a widely accepted as, as the uh, song that, that, that represents the Southern Mongolian resistance to Chinese uh, uh, colonial occupation. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have another question. Um, another person wants to know if there are any historical documents which prove the independence of Southern Mongolia. Well, <laughs> there there are many um, uh, historical documents. Um, so, um, uh, in uh, you know, uh, 1911. Uh, even before the people, uh, the Republic of China was established, Mongolia already declared, I mean, uh, I would say, instead of declared, restored their independence. And uh, so, uh, the all part of Mongolia, not just uh, Northern Mongolia, but also uh, Southern Mongolia and even Buryat, and Kalmyks, or mm -hmm. uh, they joined the uh, the independence movement, and uh, we uh, restored our independence. And uh, actually, uh, even in in uh, no, uh, independent country of Mongolia, uh, there normally uh, during this movement, the three uh, main uh, figures were considered as the national hero. Uh, two of them are actually from Southern Mongolia. So um, and and then uh, in terms of in terms of the uh, official documents, or yes, we we had the the, the uh, constitutions, we had the government, so we had our separate uh, uh, diplomacy, and uh, even we had a um, our own currency and military. So. Uh, uh, the, the Southern Mongolians were independent nation, and uh, it was uh, up until 1949 when the Chinese Communist uh, uh, Party just uh, uh, forcibly annexed the Southern Mongolia to China. So, um, yeah, if, if we look back the history further, like uh, uh, there's a proof, strong proof uh, between Mongolia and the Mo Mongolians and the Chinese. Uh, already there, which is uh, the Great Wall. If you look at the Great Wall, that's our national boundary. Mm -hmm. That's a na national boundary. The Chinese, every uh, Chinese uh, dynasty uh, is just reaffirming and fortifying the, uh, the Great Wall to make sure that these people are separate. Mm -hmm. So, <laughs> um, it's, it's, uh, I think I think there are no other two nations, neighboring nations, uh, like Mongolians uh, and the Chinese have, have this kind of clean-cut national boundary. Mm 
in in uh, in in the world. I mean, you know, uh, so um, so this is this is the very clear, right? We were not part of China, and the Chinese have been uh, accepting this for for thousands of years, and then now all of a sudden they claim that oh now uh, the Mongolians are part of Zhonghua nationality. <laughs> it's it's absurd and illogic. Um, so yes, uh, there there the, uh, in the, in the 1930s we had a, the own government, and then there was uh, the constitution, and then all uh, government structure were there uh, as as a separate uh, nation, separate state, separate country. Mm -hmm. Um, what connections do you see in Tibetans and Southern Mongolians' forms of resistance and protest? Well, um, you know, the Mon Mongolians um, and Tibetans have a lot in common. Uh, we share the same religion, uh, Buddhism, and we, we share the, the same, uh, you know, tragic fate or tragic history, at least in the past 70 years. And then mm -hmm. we share a very um, similar way of uh, protest, uh, uh, which is a nonviolent, peaceful resistance. Uh, so uh, if, you, if you look at the, those protests, uh, uh, like uh, protests of, of uh, the past three weeks and then the, the, the previous protests, it's very similar to um, the Tibetan uh, protests uh, also. Like I, I saw I, there were um, similar protests and in, in the pro, uh, pro opposing the resisting the Chinese uh, new language policy in, in uh, Tibetan area also. Uh, I think it was like two, three years ago, right? Uh, Chinese government also said that the, you know they, they implement the exact same language policy in 2018 in Tibet and 2017 in, in uh, Xinjiang. So yes, we, we are, we have a common way of uh, protesting, very peaceful, very nonviolent uh, way of protesting. That's, that's uh, the, the common uh, way of uh, protesting between the, the Tibetan and the uh, Mongolian. Mm -hmm. Um, what does it mean to you when you see Buryat communities or Kalmyk communities protesting in solidarity? Yes, uh, we see um, uh, a number of protests uh, uh, and other activities uh, in, uh, you know, by the Mongolians, not only from Southern Mongolia and uh, around the world, but also uh, in, in, in the independent country of Mongolia, uh, Mongolians from Kalmyk and Buryat, and even uh, um, some Hazara uh, people uh, from from uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan, Afghanistan also joined the, the uh, protest um, overseas uh, to show their solidarity with the other Mongolians. So. Um, uh, you know, the Mongolians had, had a really, you know, large empire, and the Mongolian nation was a really large uh, and, and uh, covering a vast territory. So, uh, but uh, for various reasons, um, we were partitioned into different um, countries like China and Russia and even Afghanistan and Pakistan. And, but um, in, in, in our heart and mind, uh, we are one nation. We recognize uh, us as a descendant of uh, our great ancestor, Genghis Khan, and we consider ourselves um, brothers and sisters. Mm -hmm. So, so we are one people, one nation. Uh, that is why we we see uh, that many um, uh, the support from from our. Um, the, the communities from uh, Kalmyk, Buryat, and even Hazara. Uh, yes, uh, so we, we, we consider ourselves as just one people. Mm. Um, one of our viewers is asking, uh, air pollution in Mongolia is also making nomadic life very difficult. Could you share more about that? 
Okay, so um, I, I, I don't know if this is uh, the question about the independent country of Mongolia or is that the Mongolia? I think I, I, can, I can try to answer the question, uh, uh, especially in, in southern Mongolia. Yes, air pollution is also a very serious problem, but we never had the, the air pollution problem uh, until the, uh, the recently. Uh, because mm -hmm. uh, you know the Mongolian plateau is is uh, very you know we we are uh, we enjoyed a blue sky and uh, very um, clean air, uh, but that changed after the Chinese uh, took over uh, our country and especially in the past few decades, the Chinese opened up uh, mines in in southern Mongolian grassland. Um, the most of the, the mines that the Chinese opened in Southern Mongolian grasslands are op open pit mines, coal mines, has taken up, uh, occupying a large um, areas of uh, grassland and uh, this completely destroyed, of course, the land. And, you know, topsoil of the Southern Mongolia, Mongolian plateau is very thin. Once you open it up, uh, it, it's just, just a lot of dust and, you know, um, uh, the uh, sandstorms also it's it's uh, uh, another uh, you know big uh, problem because of the uh, the uh, Chinese um, uh, the root causes the Chinese uh, opened up the land and you know, not only by mining but also by large scale farming uh, so yes it's it's uh, the air quality is uh, very uh, bad in, in southern Mongolia uh, so. Well, uh, there have been also some some other reports about the uh, the uh, air pollution in in the independent country of Mongolia, especially in in Ulaanbaatar. That was uh, also part of uh, the uh, the way uh, the Mongolians, uh, Mong uh, the independent country of Mongolia, they they um, uh, many herders actually moved to the uh, the capital uh, and. Uh, uh, they started uh, burning coal, and so that that was a uh, that has been a, a, in the a, a news uh, for for some time, and I think that it's getting better there because you know they um, they have their own uh, independence, the independent country. They can resolve their problem easily, uh, but but our problem is different. Uh, we cannot uh, really resolve this uh, problem, the air pollution, easily because this is uh, uh, you know uh, the caused by the Chinese uh, colonial occupation until this occupation and it's really difficult for us to resolve these uh, all these problems in South mm -hmm. mm -hmm. Um Thank you so much. Can you share with us, um, with all of our <clears throat> viewers, why is your organization joining the Global Day of Action? What does it mean to you to be working alongside over 120 movement-based organizations? Uh, why is this important to you? Uh, yes, the the upcoming Global Day of Action is uh, organized by uh, I think more than 120 groups, joined by uh, Tibetans, Mongolians, Uyghurs, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, and uh, I think some Chinese uh, activists uh, around the world uh, to show our solidarity to resist the Chinese the regime and the Chinese Communist Party. So the, the reason why we are uh, organizing and uh, joining this, this uh, global action is that Southern Mongolians, Tibetans, Uyghurs are not the only victim of the Chinese regime. You know, Hong Kong and Taiwan are also suffering. And not only that, uh, the uh, entire population, 1.5 billion Chinese citizens of China is also uh, suffering um, of, uh, under this mm -hmm. uh, oppressive regime. So, uh, uh, in addition to that, the, the, actually the, the entire whole world is paying a very heavy uh, toll for, for the failure of taking action to stop the Chinese uh, regime's uh, domestic human rights violation and global hegemony. So, it's, it's extremely important for us to have uh, people around the world to join together to say, uh, no to the Chinese um, colonial and authoritarian regime.
Mm -hmm. How can we support those protesting in southern Mongolia? Well, um, uh, the raising awareness is, is uh, one way uh, of uh, supporting the protests, like, uh, uh, for example, uh, this live program that you, uh, you are conducting. It's, it's, a, it's an example of uh, showing your support to the Southern Mongolians. Uh, the, uh, another way is to join the, uh, the protests that are taking place around the world, uh, for example, joining this uh, upcoming Global Day Action is also uh, a good way of uh, supporting, showing your support to the, not only to the Southern Mongolia, but to Tibetans and Uyghurs and, uh, you know, uh, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese who, who are uh, uh, suffering under this, this uh, Chinese uh, communist regime. Hmm. Thank you. So I think we're going to start uh, wrapping up. If anyone has any remaining questions, now's the time to ask. I'm just going to share some information about the Global Day of Action. To all of our viewers, mark your calendars for October 1st, the Global Day of Action against the CCP. This action is led by a dynamic coalition force of Tibetans, Uyghur, Southern Mongolians, Hong Kongers, Taiwanese, Chinese, and all peoples resisting Chinese Communist Party tyranny. October 1st is the founding anniversary of the People's Republic of China, and SFT, along with over 120 leading movement-based organizations, want to make this year's anniversary a little bit special. If you're able to protest in the streets, you can check out our website to find protests in your area. Click the link below. If you will be supporting remotely, you can also sign up to SFT's email alerts to find out how you can support on the Global Day of Action um, if you're staying at home. So we're gonna be sharing some of these links. And I think that um, if you have any remaining questions, feel free to ask right now. My last question that I have for you, um, I just wanted to also share um, or ask if you could share about the Chinese migration into Southern Mongolia. Well, Chinese um, migration um, has started long back, long time ago. I Thing at least even before the uh, the communist regime was established, there have been some Chinese migration uh, in, in Southern Mongolia. But um, this migration really intensified uh, after the communist uh, China was established. Um, so some some statistics show that um, before uh, Southern Mongolia was uh, officially annexed to China in 1949, the population ratio uh, between the Chinese and Mongolians was uh, five Mongolian to one Chinese. Now this, uh, after 70 years of uh, migration, non-stop Chinese migration, is now the ratio reversed. Is now it's like five Chinese to one Mongolian in, in Southern Mongolia, especially in, in those, uh, the, the major cities, towns, the Chinese population is extremely, uh, well, uh, high and the uh, uh, ratio is even, even uh, maybe higher. Uh, and, but uh, uh, in rural areas like, uh, uh, in, in, you know, herders, communities, and those areas, uh, uh, especially in the east, uh, eastern leagues or Amex, the Mongolian uh, population percentage is uh, higher. Uh, but yes, uh, average is about five Chinese to one Mongolian in southern Mongolia. Wow. Thank you so much again for joining us. Um, if you click the link below, you'll find some links to uh, petitions that you can sign and information for the Southern Mongolian Human Rights Information Center and Students for Free Tibet. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure to see you. And I hope, Thank you for that, me. Um, I hope that you enjoyed your time on SFT Live <laughs> and I'll see you, you again Andy. soon. All right. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye.